<laughs> it was in March of 1966, basketball tournament, district tournament in Miles City. And I, no. I'm not real sure, but I think it burned down Friday night because I woke up Saturday morning and the people I went to told me that the high school had burned down the night before. They never did know quite how it started, but an engineer on the train going by did see flames. And I'm not sure if he's the one that reported it, but there's a lot of stories. But you never know uh, just how it started. And so we spent the next the years of 67, 68, 68, 69, going to the Southside School and around Wolf Point and various buildings attending classes. Right. The first year, the high school senior class graduated in the, in, from the football field. That's where the ceremonies were held. The next year was in the Southside School gym. And then uh, I graduated the year of 1970, which is this class reunion. And we were the first senior class to graduate from the new high school. Well, the family roots uh, go back to the Wolf Point community. Both my wife, Jean, and I uh, were raised in the Wolf Point area, attended both elementary and, and high school there. Um, my parents came from Minnesota and Wisconsin in that second decade of this century, a time when northeastern Montana was filling up. Uh, my wife, Jean's parents, came from uh, the old country, from Norway, and uh, we wound up uh, living about five miles apart and attending the same one-room elementary school for uh, all eight years. Uh, uh, what was then the South School and has disappeared the year that we graduated from the eighth grade. Uh, I don't know what the coincidence is on that. Uh, the uh, uh, Both dryland farmers, uh, sort of uh, struggled through the teens and the 1920s and then learned to survive in the 1930s. And uh, certainly when I left the farm in, uh, to join the service in 1943, uh, although things had substantially improved in both terms of weather and prices for grain, the memories that I, uh, I took away from Wolf Point when I went in the uh, Army were, were memories of uh, dust and drought and grasshoppers and uh, uh, family trying to survive. I mean, there was never a sense of feeling poor, although obviously we, we had very little, in fact, for most of the years of the 1930s. The cash income that flowed into the Schwinden household came primarily from the uh, oh, six, eight, or nine dollars a week uh, of sales that my mother made on Saturday by delivering cottage cheese and homemade sweet butter, uh, sometimes some eggs. At times eggs were so cheap we threw them in as a, uh, uh, a loss leader, I guess, uh, in order to stimulate sales. Because, uh, you know, in some of those years uh, there was very, very little crop. Uh, and uh, at that time I certainly had no intention of returning to the farm and in fact after the war, uh, went to college right away with some kind of idea of probably getting into academic life, and uh, uh, that actually uh, didn't happen until uh, an awfully lot later, after a lot of uh, farm and political years. But we moved back to the Wolf Point area uh, to stay uh, uh, in 1954 and remained there until 1969 when we moved to Hell and I became a member of the uh, cabinet of, of Governor Forrest Anderson. Uh, let's see, 1915, I was born 1915, and I started at the <coughs> Presbyterian boarding school at Old Town, I believe it was 1922. I don't remember the dates too well, but it is early then. And now I, I went there to us. I guess it went up to about the fourth grade or something like that. And then I transferred to the public school over here. But uh, even then, I'll, I'll tell a background. Among the missionaries, talking Indian, dancing Indian, anything Indian was taboo. Yeah, you're you're classified as a heathen or something like that. They, I mean, they didn't come right out and say you're a heathen, but that is bad. 
that's the way they pr preached to us. And uh, Old Town was a sub-agency for the Indians here. That's where they'd get their payments and so forth, whatever they had coming. And goddamn right now, when you where did you come from to go there to that school? Oh, uh, my parents lived out to a little station out here. They called Macon, about six seven miles east of Wolf Point. They drove me in and my little bundle of clothes. And that is by team and by wagon that time. And I didn't see them till see I think Christmas Christmas vacation, I think. They come in and got me. But I remember the old man he had a Fill the wagon box by the sleigh. That wagon box they had in the sleigh filled it full of hay and wrapped me up pretty warm because it must have been about 30 below zero, I remember, when we were going home. But that's the way we traveled. Was that school down here or when did they build it from up here? Oh, they moved the buildings. That, is, uh, that was in the 30s sometimes. They moved the building, the church, everything. But uh, the church itself, uh, there's a lot of our Indians was baptized in there. The Presbyterians. But the uh, first part of the, when the Assiniboines were uh, more or less stationed around here, I mean, this was always their area, that Father Pierre de Schmidt was among them for years and baptized a lot of people. I'm Robert Dumont. I'm the director of Nace College, which is an accredited four-year Bachelor of Arts program serving the Fort Peck tribes. I'm one of the founders of that school. My family has been here for since time beginning, basically. The, uh, my grandfather, who was a notorious cowboy, Frank Dumont, was one of the first cowboys or clowns at the Wolf Point Rodeo when it began as a, as a stampede as part of the Indian community. I was educated here in the Wolf Point schools, attended the University of Montana, the University of Colorado, and Harvard University. For the Fort Peck tribes, I'm the director of the tribal archives, and I've worked in a variety of positions with them. One of the courses that I teach is local history. And how I came to local history is that I felt that somehow the history of place in this area was more complex than what appeared. And one of the things that has happened over the years, and I think it's because Montana is a, a virtually a young state, and this region, this area, was, was a place that had the last Indian Wars, basically. And it was one of the last areas to be settled. Basically, it was because we're known as the Great American Desert. And until we controlled water, there was virtually no use for this kind of arid land. Now, much of those, those last wars were fought south of the river. And to understand our history, we really need to, to understand regional history that, that extends down into the Billings area and over into the Dakotas. The, um, our departure here in Wolf Point, as Wolf Point celebrates its jubilee, is 75, the 75 years go back to some very special legislation that was created by the United States Congress. And it began in 19, 1907 when the first hearings were, heard, were held. Um, here on the reservation. And what it was to do was to finally allot uh, tribal people. And what it, the basic intent of it was to transfer, 
to transfer indiv to individuals ownership of land with the assumption that they would become <clears throat> profitable farmers. The second point of that was to do away with all tribal land in this particular legislation, which the tribes know as the 1908 Allotment Act. Now, inside of that act was the, were the conditions by which the Homestead Acts for general land entry and all the subsequent amendments to that were allowed for the opening of the reservation. Now, part and parcel of that were the conditions that certain tracts of land would be set aside for schools and for towns. So that begins then the, that begins then the, or establishes the framework for the incorporation of the town of Wolf Point. Wolf Point itself has a much longer history than, than prior to that. Now, once the Allotment Act was implemented, the, the, the first thing that had to be done was that the reservation had to be surveyed to determine which lands were what kind of value for farming or for grazing or whatever have you. And the town sites were established. There were considerably more towns established on the reservation than exist today. The, uh, the, the second thing that it did very curiously is that when legislation was passed, they forgot that people would be born after the day of legislation. And so when the land was parceled out for individual ownerships with a 320, uh, a 320 farming track, a 40-acre, uh, a 40-acre bottom line track, and a 20-acre uh, timber track for heads of household, uh, <clears throat> they ran into the problem that people continued to to be born, and they had to continue to allot them. Uh, so with the Allotment Act itself was amended numerous times, uh, and it did not stop by any special law on the allotment. What, what occurred was that, was that it was supposed to, to have stopped by the Indian Reorganization Act uh, of 1934, which, which Montana is, is responsible for that under Senator Wheeler. And the, the intent of that act was to transfer government back to, back to tribes. Once they accepted the Indian Reorganization Act, allotment itself stopped because people had become aware that, that great frauds were being created relative to allotment and the transfer of, transfer of lands uh, in, in terms of title back to Indians. And we, and we suffered some of the same, some of the same frauds here. Um, one of them resulted in an accounting claim against the United States government that took 27 years to, to resolve over the management of, of revenues for the sale of land to homesteaders on the reservation. We know that as Docket 184. The, um, and there was a procedure that people went through after receiving, after receiving the allotments and while the, the uh, homesteading process began. And it was a simple little procedure that was called shoot the arrow. And then Indians were brought into the agency in Poplar, and they were asked to simply shoot a bow with an arrow. And then they were declared competent. And what happened with the declaration of competency was that the transfer of title to the land in fee simple uh, was given to the Indians. And then the processes of, of tax procedures or the sale of it began. Um, and so there was that kind of fraud going on here and in other areas of the country. So allotment itself, because we because the tribe did not elect to did not elect to have Indian Reorganization Act here, but had already established basically a democratic form of government with their constitution in 27, 1927, uh, it took a secretarial order to, to stop allotment here. Well, I was taught, and I think Bobby's been taught, is, uh, even my old grandpa, I mean, couldn't read or write, they'd say, you treat people the way you want to be treated. And I think you white guys got that same saying, too. And my mother, she went farther than that. She always told me, saying hello or something, something pleasant, she said, don't cost you a nickel. 
27, 17th of May. This fellow has been convicted of murdering a man and his wife. They were a fine couple farmers up east around Freud country. The reason he married, uh, married murdered them, he wanted to steal their car. They had just bought a Model T. And uh, it sold for $475. Now, when you figure it all out, there were three lives lost over a car that cost $475. It don't make sense, does it? Murdered, nice, fine couple doing fine. Yeah, he... Uh, he wanted that car, and he hid out in the brush along the creek where the, they had their buildings. When that farmer came in with his four horses to the barn, that fellow stepped out, and he shot him down like a dog. The wife heard the shot. She ran out, and then he came out of the barn and chased her into the shack, cabin, and uh, shot her down. He had to shoot her twice to get her down. He shot her once in the arm and once somewhere else. You know, <clears throat> then he stole the car. You know, <clears throat> now, how did they catch him? What, what, what happened then? Like, uh, somebody must have chased him or they found him somewhere? Yes, they saw him in the car. Somebody saw him in the car. And he was going down to around Dickinson to where his girlfriend was. So he wasn't hard to trace. Yeah, he come back. Was arrested and tried. Kept him in jail here about a year before they hung him. Yeah. And you were a deputy, a deputy then, Mr.? Yes, I was asked to serve by the sheriff. Sheriff John Anderson. Charlie Council was his deputy. And that night I was third in command. Yeah. I stood at the foot of the gallows when they brought the prisoner out of the jail. For this reason, if anybody interfered with the bringing him down to the gallows, I was to shoot. But I'm telling you folks, you heard the old gag about you could hear a pin drop. You could hear it that night along there. Nobody spoke. Nobody made a noise. Marched them up to the gallows. Uh, they, uh, they had an awful time trying to make the rope short enough so he would fall in the air instead on the ground. But instead of shortening the rope, they dug a pit under the gallows, about two and a half feet deep and big, wide. And the night before, it rained just like it did last night and it filled that pit up with water. So I had to go down in that pit and stand there until they cut a man down. And I caught him in my arms, carried him over to the side of the pit. Others were there to take him. And then uh, Clayton. Uh, worked on them after we took them up there. But you know, uh, you're not supposed to cut the, ne the rope off his neck. You're supposed to take it off. So I took it off, but it was a hard job. And I took a big screwdriver and a hammer to loosen it up. 
You should have seen the mob of people going up to get a piece of that long rope. Souvenirs. And when I got that off his neck, I just threw it out on the street. And there were men there to cut that up, too. Pat Sweeten was my best friend and out on the homestead. And he was he was called into the army, and he went over and he fought. And when the war was over in 18, General Pershing called him up into, into France, Paris, France. And Pershing and General Fuchs, I think they called him, French general, they were standing there waiting to receive these soldiers that were recommended for different things. So Tweetin walked up to him and Pershing shook his hand, smiled, and he handed them our highest honor, Congressional Medal of Honor. Then General Foch, he shook Mr. Tweetin hand, and he handed him the highest French medal that you'd give him. So that grand man come home with two of the highest medals in the world. What a man he was. What a man he was. What was special about him? He was just a good man, a good man, a good neighbor, good friend and honest about everything. Yeah. Did you, did he tell you uh, anything about his experiences in the war? Yeah, uh, yes. I mean, he must have done something pretty special to he did. get all those awards. And it took him 50 years before he told me. Now, you won't believe that hardly. I waited for 50 years to have him tell me how he got this medal. He got it by cleaning out a machine nest. He's, he was alone. He shot three of the soldiers down, and as they told me, I couldn't shoot any more of them. There was two left. They were fighting for their country the same as I was. So he let he just took them prison. Showed the big heart of the fellow. Yeah, he was an all around, all around grand man. Yeah. And he grew up here, I gather. He was a no. He he was born in Norway. Oh. Yeah. Come over to North Dakota and spent a couple of years there with relatives. And then he come out to Montana and homesteader. One summer I went out and spent uh, the whole summer out there on the range with the Shirley. And um, they decided to go to Mile City with a little herd of horses. So I went along to cook and we uh, got into Mile City and Shirley said, well, we'll get a room. and. So we'll shower. So we did. So we got in bed and we rolled and we tossed and we rolled and we tossed because we were used to sleeping out on the ground. So we finally decided uh, that wasn't for us, those bit, that bed. So um, we um, took our bedding and made a bed on the floor and slept real good. And the next morning we woke up and we started to giggle. We used to laugh. We said, if somebody opened that door, saw a couple nuts sleeping on the floor, they'd wonder what, <laughs> what was going on. <laughs> but Shirley and I had a little teepee tent that we slept in. We had a, a good roundup bed, a lot of nice good wool blankets. And um, then the boys had their beds and they scattered all around from the cook, uh, Canton around, and uh, one time, believe it or not, in the 30s, it did rain once, and uh, we got all the bedding wet, 
and the next morning uh, everybody was uh, throwing their blankets out on the sagebrush to dry them out so we could go to bed that night. But it worked. There were six of the children, I was the oldest, and he brought us into Wolf Point, brought all the kids into Wolf Point and put them with people here in town. Families took them, and I stayed on the farm with him. He was running a coal mine out there, and uh, mining coal, and, and I was taking care of the cows and milking cows and water, taking them with the water and stuff. And finally in the spring, he just had to give up, and he came into town, and uh, he, uh, we, he rented the house on the south side of town here, and us kids all stayed in that house with my my aunt came and took care of us that summer. And then in the fall, uh, they sent us all to the orphan's home in Great Falls, uh, St. Thomas Orphan's Home. Except my youngest brother, Paul, he was only a year and a half old. A family here took care of him and kept him. And I spent two years at St. Thomas. And it was quite different from a uh, black farm boy. I knew nothing about the city or anything. Go to Great Falls, a big city, and uh, being an orphan's home and the nuns, the sisters, you know, and. Uh, so many boys together, and the girls were off in a separate park by themselves. And, and then after two years, the nuns couldn't keep us after the boys after they were 12 years old. They mm -hmm. couldn't keep them at that time. So then Father Shevlin had a boys' home at Laurel, Montana. He had 35, about 35 boys down there. Then I sent a bunch of us from the office home down there, and I spent a year down there. And then. Uh,